All right, we're going to get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, today, we're talking about planning ahead for the 2020 census and elections. Uh, if you are a long time or repeat visitor to Nonprofit Votes webinars, you may notice that we have switched platforms. Uh, we used to use ReadyTalk, and now we use Zoom. So uh, please bear with us. This is our first time using Zoom, and so um, I will be doing my best to keep it a seamless experience. Um, and we have some great speakers lined up today. So they have a lot of awesome content to share with you, um, and they will be taking your questions. Um, we're going to keep all participants on mute, so you can ask your questions using either the chat function or the Q&A box. So I'll be checking both of those. All right, now if you are not familiar with Nonprofit Vote, we were founded in 2005 to help America's nonprofits engage the people they serve in voting and elections. We have plenty of nonpartisan resources on our website to help get you going. Um, so visit our website. We also have uh, revived our Nonprofits Count campaign, uh, which we ran in 20, 2009, 2010 for uh, the last census. And so uh, we have some census-related uh, resources specifically as well. Um, and there are many resources all across the web, including um, uh, resources from Asian Americans Advancing Justice, where we have one of our speakers uh, coming from. And uh, there's, you know, we're happy to help connect you with uh, the resources that you're looking for if you can't quite find either a census resource or a voter engagement resource that's fitting your needs. So please reach out to us. So getting into our topics for today, um, I'll briefly go over some major dates for 2020. So just some things to keep in mind this winter, spring, summer, and fall. Um, so as you are planning ahead for the next year, you can keep these major dates on your calendar. Then we will have Bessie Chan Smitham talking about Census 2020. So what your nonprofit can do to ensure an accurate count of communities and she'll lay out some uh, census basics as well. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about primary races, you know, how you can talk about issues, candidates, and even the conventions coming up. And then Louisa Hackett is here to share about the general election and the planning you should start now to get ready and get voters registered. And we will wrap up with a Q&A with these presenters. So. Uh, please send us your questions as they come up. So we will keep moving right along because there's so much good content and we wanna make sure we have time for those questions. So these major dates in 2020 that you want to sort of have at the top of your mind and um, in your planning. Uh, first, you know, in this winter, the primaries and caucuses will begin. Those will begin in early February. Uh, but the dates for registration and getting voters in your state registered to participate in those elections uh, could be as much as a month earlier. So you could be looking at a January um, or early February deadline. So make sure you check the dates for elections and registration deadlines in your state. And keep in mind, many states have a presidential primary and statewide primaries on different dates, often months apart. So make sure you find out all of those dates, including primaries and special elections. Um, you'll want to be conducting your education and awareness around census in winter, um, because in spring, while those primaries and caucuses are continuing, uh, the census postcards will go out in March for households to do self-response. Um, in mid-May, a numerator follow-up will begin. So spring is the perfect time to really um, remind and push the communities you work with to self-response so they don't have someone coming and knocking on their door. 
uh, in the summer, you can turn your all your focus back to um, voter engagement, making sure those your voters are registered. Um, at, you know, people at your community, in your community, or at your organization, your staff, uh, volunteers. Um, make sure you reach as many people as possible. Um, the summer is perfect time to do that. It'll also be when major party conventions are happening, so. Um, Voting and elections will really be in the news even more than they already are. Um, and the enumerator will wrap up in July. Uh, and we get to fall, uh, my favorite season, um, election season, but also my birthday. Um, so we have National Voter Registration Day on September 22nd. So I think in the spring you can, um, we'll have our sign up form available for National Voter Registration Day so that you can sign up to become a partner. The deadlines for voter registration um, in many states are in early to mid-October, though some states will allow you to register right up to and on uh, Election Day. And Election Day is November 3rd. So it's quite a busy year that we have ahead of us. And it all starts with the census. So I am going to turn over uh, our slide Oops. and turn it over uh, to Bessie to tell us a little more about what Asian Americans Advancing Justice is doing and what you can do around Census 2020. Great. Thank you, Caitlin. I'm Bessie and I'm the Assistant Director of Community Engagement at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC in DC. We work alongside our four Asian Americans Advancing Justice affiliates in Atlanta, Chicago, Los Angeles, and San Francisco to lead our Count Us in 2020 Census campaign, which is focused on the Asian American, Native, Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander, or AANHPI community. Next slide, please. First, I wanted to highlight three important websites that host a wealth of information and resources that you can use in your census work. Um, first, the Census Bureau's website is 2020census.gov. You can find information on how to respond to the census, promotional materials for getting the word out about census jobs and recruitment, customizable PSAs, language support resources in 59 non-English languages, and more. Our campaign website is countusin2020.org, and I'll talk more about our resources later. Uh, and lastly, Census Counts is a national network of national, state, and local groups working on the census, and their website is censuscounts.org. Their partners include the American Library Association, Ready Nation, which focuses on outreach to businesses, Faith and Public Life, the National LGBTQ Task Force, Partnership for America's Children, which focuses on the undercount of young kids, and more. And they also convene the State's Count Action Network to connect local get out the count network so community leaders and CBOs and CQCs can convene, share resources, and discuss challenges and best practices. And the Census Counts campaign recently released a new toolkit to help partners in their census work, which draws on the knowledge of all of these organizations and leaders. Next slide, please. So what is the census and why is it important? As you all probably know, every 10 years, the U.S. government counts every person living in the U.S through the census as required by the Constitution. It impacts funding, reapportionment, and redistricting. Next slide. Being counted in the census helps you and your family. A state or area's receipt of its fair share of federal funds depends on the accuracy of its census population count. And the stakes are high. According to a new report from George Washington University, Data from the census are used to divide over $1.5 trillion of government funding annually. That's funding for hospitals, schools, and roads. Next slide. And census is important for political representation. The data are used to determine how many seats in the U.S. House of Representatives each state gets, which translates to political power for your community. It's also used to redraw political district maps at all levels of government, protect voters against discrimination based on race, and make sure jurisdictions provide language assistance to voters. Next slide. Every person living in the U.S. and every community benefits from an accurate census. If someone in our community isn't counted, it hurts us all. Next slide. This 
is a high-level overview of Census Bureau operations. In January, enumeration starts in remote communities. Enumeration starts in remote areas of Alaska uh, starting in January. In March, census postcards are sent to most homes, and I'll go more into this in the next slide. And from May to July, census workers visit addresses that did not complete a census questionnaire to collect information at the door. This is called non-response follow-up, or NERFIO. And it might actually start earlier in April in areas that have a lot of off-campus college students. And lastly, in December, the census director delivers a portion of counts to the president. Next slide. This is a graphic that the Census Bureau released um, on how the 2020 census will invite everyone to respond. Um, so on, on the left side of the graphic, you see that um, from March 12th to 20th, an invitation to respond online to the 2020 census will be sent out. And some households will also a paper, receive a paper questionnaire at this point. And there's different reminders that are sent. Um, everyone who doesn't respond by the fourth mailing will receive the paper questionnaire in the mail. Next slide. So this information is from the census counts toolkit that I had mentioned. So from January through March um, is education and awareness. So the Census Bureau ad campaign goes live. The Census Bureau begins enumeration in remote areas of Alaska um, January 21st. And as organizations or leaders working on the census, we are educating our communities about the census, what it is, how to participate, how to get assistance, um, and how they will be invited to respond. Um, any events you might be hosting might focus on encouraging households to respond during the self-response period that comes next. And it's also a great time to be sharing with your community members what your Get at the Count plan is. So how are you supporting communities? Do you have translated materials? Um, are you able to help folks get connected to computers and Wi-Fi to fill out the form online? What can they expect from you? And of course, for many of us, um, this work starts much earlier. It's before January 2020, and a lot of us are already working on this right now. Next slide, please. From mid-March to April 30th is the self-response option. Um, and these are when you might have peak census outreach efforts. So the Census Bureau ad campaign drives um, a response to the census message, and this is when they mail out the census materials to all households. April 1st, 2020 is census date, just a reference date because um, you're able to respond um, the entire time during this period. But April 1st is a really good opportunity to do days of action um, or to have some kind of event to get people thinking about the census and um, helping them understand how to respond um, and where they can go to for assistance. And a lot of our organizations will be focused on um, engaging hard to count or historically counted communities. Um, and then also the Census Bureau's Rome map and the City University of New York's hard to count map will be updated to display daily self-response rates, rates by each census tract. Next slide, please. From mid-May to July is non-response follow-up or NERFU. So this is when census takers will be going door to door and they'll be reminding people to, um, to reply, but also there'll be enumerators going door to door to collect that information. Next slide, please. You may often hear the term hard to count. Um, this is a term that's used by the Census Bureau. And some communities are especially hard to count. This means that in these communities, it's likely that many people will not respond to the census. And so there are a lot of um, issues when you're a historically undercounted community because census data impacts so much. Um, $1.5 trillion of federal funding annually, political representation, and communities that are historically undercounted include um, racial and ethnic minorities, people who rent, um, people with limited English proficiency, immigrants, and young children. Next slide, please. There has been a lot of fear and confusion around the census. And one thing that has been really important for many census advocates to lift up is that we have the strongest confidential confidentiality protections in place to protect the data. So your census responses are totally confidential. Extremely strong laws protect the confidentiality of your response, and the Census Bureau is not allowed to share your personal information with anyone, including ICE, police, government agencies, your landlord. Um, census Bureau data is really used for statistical purposes. Um, and if a Census Bureau employee wrongly shares census data, they could be given five years in prison or a $250,000 fine. So there are very strong protect, uh, protections in place to uh, preserve the confidentiality of your information. Next slide. And as many of you know, there are a lot of um, new things with the 2020 census. So 2020 will be the first time that people can respond online to the census. Um, and this is 
um, primarily the way that the Census Bureau will, ask, will be asking most people to respond. And there will also be a way to respond to the census via telephone. Um, so people can call to ask questions, but they can also fill out the census via telephone. And there will be 12 non-English languages um, available on the online form and 59 non-English language materials in terms of uh, language assistance. Uh, it's important to note that the paper form in 2020 will be available in English and Spanish only. And in 2020, there are no Native American or Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander language options for the forms. And in terms of language assistance, um, there are no Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander languages uh, offered at all. Next slide. There will also be a question on the form asking other people in the house of their relation to person one on the form and will include a same-sex relationship option. Um, also, the Census Bureau will not be funding questionnaire assistance centers, meaning that it will be on community-based organizations to host these. Instead, they're pursuing a mobile response initiative, which is going to be very different than what they had in 2010 with, 2010 with questionnaire assistance. Um, and also, recruitment for census takers and other positions will only be online. Next slide. I wanted to uh, go over some of the key findings of our messaging research. We focused on the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community, but um, I want to highlight that a lot of organizations have done messaging research, um, and so I can share those links uh, with Caitlin afterwards to circulate to this group. But I'm going to go over some of the messaging findings from our research on the AANHPI community. And if you want to take a deeper dive, we did a whole webinar on this um, where it dives more into each finding. So our messaging research was conducted through in-person focus groups as well as an online survey. Next slide. Um, and this is some information about the people who were surveyed. It reflects the diverse Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander population in the country. Next slide. One thing that was really important for us to know was that a majority, 55% of AANHPIs, had not heard anything about the upcoming 2020 census. Next slide. And also less than half, 47% of AANHPIs knew that everyone in the country, regardless of immigration status, is required to participate in the census. Everyone is meant to be counted, um, and that's something that's very important for us to list up in a lot of the outreach that we do. Next slide. And this is just an example of some of the messages that were the most effective. We tested a lot of different messages, and we have a toolkit that lays out all the messages, as well as which me messages resonated the, the most within specific racial groups, as well as which messages um, resonated the most uh, across different regions. And I'll go more into the toolkit in a few slides. Next slide, please. So with the Count Us in 2020 campaign, we're working um, to do materials development focused on the AANHPI community, but a lot of our materials are really relevant for anyone who's doing that account work. So I wanted to go over some of those resources. First um, is our website, website countusin2020.org. This is the central hub for all the things that we're producing. And we also have a partner resources page where we have listed um, different toolkits, webinars, fact sheets from our partner organizations like the American Library Association, like Safe and Public Life, um, like the National LGBTQ Task Force. Um, so if you're looking for a compilation of resources from all the partners that we're working with, um, there's a really great page to visit on countisin2020.org. And I know a lot of our resources are also cross-listed on our partners' pages. Um, so we had launched our Get Out the Count campaign in April 2018. And um, throughout 2018, we solicited feedback from our partners, different community leaders, on what materials are helpful and also what translations are helpful for our plan. Next slide. So I'm gonna go over some of the things that we've produced in terms of webinars. Um, all of our webinars are uh, a live event and then we also have a recording and accompanying blog that circulated. We also have a community engagement and communications toolkit, um, which I'll dive more into later. Um, we also have fact sheets. So we have five issue focused fact sheets on the importance of data disaggregation, um, confidentiality, and the citizenship question. Um, we also have state fact sheets that dive into the AANHPI populations within each state and also the um, federal funding that goes to each state that's determined by census data. We also just launched a new Count on Your Census podcast. Um, we have three episodes of that and we're planning the next three right now. Next slide, please. So this is a list of the webinars that we've hosted so far. We've had 13. Um, and as I mentioned, all of these webinars are recorded. Uh, so you can find a recording of them on countisin2020.org. Next slide. 
This is an overview of what's covered in our toolkit. Um, we have information about our campaign, some frequently asked questions about the 2020 census some, and some misconceptions. Um, also, we have facts and figures from the 2010 census. Uh, the 2010 census showed us that the AANHPI community is the fastest growing racial group in the U.S. So all the data that came from it was huge for lifting up the visibility of our community and helping us see um, where are states where historically we haven't seen large AANHPI populations, um, where there's been incredible growth in the last 10 years. And there's also information on how to get out the cat in your community, which I'll go over during this webinar, um, including uh, Census Bureau partnerships, working with CCCs, and different ways to get out information. Next slide. The toolkit also includes an overview of some Census Bureau information. So contact information for a regional census center, um, the language assistance plan from the Census Bureau, and also a large component of this toolkit focuses on communications. Um, so going over our messaging research as well as um, looking at how you might be able to engage press, whether it be writing op-eds, letters to the editor, um, and then also a social media sub toolkit on the different platforms you can use and tips for engagement and different tools you can use within Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Next slide. This is an example of a state fact sheet that we created. So this is for DC. Um, and again, we have state fact sheets for all um, 50 states plus DC, and those can be found on our website. And then lastly, next slide. Um, our get at the count fact sheets. So these fact sheets, um, we have 12 of them. So the first 10 are posted. We're finalizing number 11 and 12 right now. Um, these are fact sheets that are really be meant, meant to be used by community-based organizations, and they can be shared with community members at different events that you might have. Um, for all of our get at the count fact sheets, the English version goes through review of our partners to make sure that um, we're using easy to understand language, that these are um, going to be helpful tools. And then these get out the count fact sheets are also being translated into 15 Asian languages. Um, and there'll be a subset that's tailored for the native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community and translated it into eight Hawaiian and Pacific Islander languages. And I'll go more into the languages that we're covering through that translation plan. Next slide. And lastly, the newest thing that we produce is our census podcast, Count on Your Census. Um, so check it out and share it with your networks because we'd love to be able to reach people in different ways and we hope that this podcast can be useful for the get out the count work that you're doing. Next slide. I wanted to take a few minutes to go over language support because I know that for a lot of our get out the count work, we might be working with limited English proficient communities. Next slide. So in 2020, there is expanded language support, um, and you can see on this slide uh, the different support that was offered in 2010 versus 2020. Um, and this is determined, um, the new set of languages is determined from ACS data, um, where the threshold was determined at 60,000 households um, that might be considered limited English proficient, meaning that no one in the household 14 or older speaks English only or English very well. So on the, um, online form, um, there's going to be uh, assistance in 12 non-English languages, and the same thing with um, phone support. There'll be assistance as well um, for 12 non-English languages. For Chinese, that includes Mandarin and Cantonese. Next slide. And these are some of the language support resources that are up on the Census Bureau's website. So again, that's 2020census.gov. They have language glossaries in 59 non-English languages. Um, so these are commonly census terms that are translated, um, and it prevents um, situations where people might have to translate on a fly. So it includes um, different words that you might want to use when you're talking about the census or you're producing materials about the census. There's also a language ID card that Census Bureau employees will use when they um, go to households. So if they encounter a household that um, doesn't speak English, they can identify in the card which language they speak, and the person will follow up with someone who might speak that language. And there's also language guides in video and print um, that walk through the census form. Next slide. Um, this shows the 59 non-English languages that are um, covered under the language support plan, and where there aren't languages that are covered, they have um, templates that organizations can use if they want to create those materials for different language communities. Next slide. And lastly, um, this is a list of the translations that we have planned for our Get Out the Count fact sheet. So again, that's 12 main fact sheets for the AE and HPI community, and then a subset that's tailored for the native one to the Goddard community that um, our partner in Power Pacific Islander Communities, or EPIC, um, is creating. So um, some of our translated fact sheets are currently up on our website, um, and the rest will be going up in the next 
few months. Next slide. So ways to get out the count. Next slide. First, um, one way is to become a Census Bureau partner. We need community members who know our communities and know how best to reach them to become Census Bureau partners. Partners come together to spread the message about the importance of participation in their communities. And these community members are census ambassadors that bridge communities and help to create awareness about the importance of participating. Conducting the census is a massive and vitally important undertaking, one in which the Census Bureau can only accomplish with the help and partnerships of community messengers. So you can sign up to be a partner at 2020census.gov and they also have a partnership toolkit and also regular updates as new resources, whether it's PSAs or customizable materials come out. And also remember, the Census Bureau is running a nationwide recruitment campaign right now to hire nearly 500,000 people um, to work on Census Bureau operations to ensure fair and accurate census. They recently received authorization to hire work authorized bilingual non-citizens, namely to be enumerators. So please help get out the word about recruitment and job opportunities. And next, you can also connect with or establish the Complete Count Committee. Um, the 2020 Census provides an opportunity for everyone to be counted, and the Complete Count Committee program is key to raising awareness in local communities across the country. These committees should include representatives from a really wide range of local social and economic sectors, churches and religious groups, civil rights organizations, corporations, unions, the media, sports, entertainment, service providers, and so on. So check out the Census Bureau guides and resources on complete count committees on their website. They also have an interactive map of CCCs to show where they are and how you can contact them. And the City University of New York, CUNY, also has a really great interactive map with local CCC information and contact information for organizations that are working on Get Out the Count in those states and different areas within the state. Um, and we also want to uh, talk to local funders. So the Funders Committee on Civic Participation, they convene a funder census initiative, which includes resources and um, information for funders to, to take a look at when they're looking to get involved in Get Out the Count work. Um, we also want to create and distribute outreach materials. So I highlighted some of the materials that we have, um, which you can find on our website, and you can find more from different organizations working on the census at censuscounts.org. So get your local businesses involved and leave information at your local grocery store, restaurants, and other businesses where people regularly visit. Work with community leaders at places of worship or community centers to raise the visibility of the census and its impact during their programming and regular announcements. Do you host different classes or events in your space? Um, do you have a youth group or a senior group that you convene? Do you provide different trainings at different locations and spaces? These are all great opportunities to share some information and materials um, through the work that you're already doing. And also, consider canvassing neighborhoods. A great way to increase awareness about the upcoming census is to canvass specific neighborhoods, especially those that are home to people who might be wary of completing the census form or might not understand the importance of an accurate count. But to keep in mind that timing is really important. The majority of census workers will be in this field beginning in mid May for non response follow up or interview. Um, and any canvassing should really take place before May 2020 to prevent any confusion as census takers are starting their operations. And also keep in mind that canvassing should be for educational purposes only. No one other than Census Bureau employees should be going door to door to collect information for the census. Doing so could create confusion for households that have already responded or those who might be interviewed by census takers because they haven't responded to the census already. So use this as an opportunity to also raise awareness of how to identify an official census worker to help people avoid any scams um, or any activities like that. Next. Additional ways to, next slide. Oh, sorry, this slide. Um, additional ways to get out the count is to go to different events. An effective outreach campaign should target people at various events and locations throughout the community. Um, so different holidays, local festivals, community events, they're all really great, and important, um, or really great and important ways to reach communities at places where they might already gather. And also bring materials to share with community members. And also you can plan your own events. Not all educational events have to be large scale productions. It could be as simple as inviting a few people to your office for a brown bag lunch. You can also raise awareness and build energy and enthusiasm for a, for a campaign by organizing a town meeting. Or if you want a more festive atmosphere, try a block party. If you do want to do a more large scale event, um, assess what staff or volunteer support you have to plan and implement your event. Also develop a timeline that includes outreach of turnout attendees, 
securing outside speakers if needed, implementing the event, and following up after event to share additional resources or action items. Your event invitation should include a date, time, location, host information, what to expect during the event, and a contact for any questions. And your event budget may also need to account for food and beverage, um, venue fees, audiovisual equipment, and printed materials. Also consider setting up a location where people can get information and fill out their forms. You can work with your state, your county, your city, complete count committees to establish, coordinate, and publicize assistance centers to help community members with their census questions and submitting their census forms. You can consider working with trusted partners like public libraries, schools, community centers, and more. And your assistance center can host events to raise awareness about the census, answer questions, provide language assistance and print translated resources, or provide tablets and computers with internet access for submitting forms. And promote use of these spaces through social media, local social and cultural organizations, places of worship, community-based organizations, um, newspapers or newsletters, places of employment, service provider offices and doctor's offices or other places where people might congregate. And lastly, utilize community opportunities, communications opportunities for census education. So engage with both mainstream um, local media and ethnic media in the 2020 census, and also distribute census information via your group's newsletter, your email list, message boards, or whatever else you might use to communicate with your community members. And use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, WeChat, and other platforms to share information about the census as well. And so these are just a few of the ways to get at the count. Um, I know this list is not comprehensive because there's so many creative ways to do this work. Um, but if you're interested in finding more information, you can go to our census toolkit, which is at uh, countison2020.org, or you can go see the census count toolkit, which is at censuscounts.org. Thank you. That's it for my presentation, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. You were able to pack so much into this short amount of time. Um, we have a bunch of great questions. I'm actually going to hold those to the end of the webinar. Um, but I did get a couple people asking if they will be able to get a copy of the slide presentation. And yes, um, there will be an email that goes out uh, next week that will include the recording of this webinar, as well as the slide deck. So there was lots of great info that Bessie had to move through quickly. Uh, so you'll have some time to to take it a little slower and, and read it deeply uh, next week. Um, so I'm going to quickly talk about primary elections. Now, remember, when I say primary, you know, I think most of us think about the presidential primary. There was a debate last night. It's kind of on the top of everyone's mind. But primary elections for statewide office and even local office, I think, are really important. And in a lot of places, that's essentially where someone gets elected. Um, I live in, um, in the Boston area. And you know our primaries are really where we decide who's going to represent us because we we know that you know in our case uh, it's going to be a Democrat that is elected to the office so it's a sort of a choice within that party so if that is the case for you um, and even if it's not the case and it's a little more um, you know more of a purple election uh, where you're at. Uh, having input in the primary is really important. So as I mentioned earlier, some of these primaries, uh, some of the presidential primaries happen on a completely different date, months ahead of when the statewide primaries happen. But here's a little guidance that applies to any kind of primary election. So some things you make, want to make sure you are doing are uh, continuing to advocate for your issues, causes, and community. You want to make sure voters are registered ahead of primary elections and that they know when those elections are and where they can vote. Um, and you, you want to engage with candidates, and you can do this in a nonpartisan way. A great, for instance, here is a candidate may ask if they can visit your organization, and you can absolutely accept, uh, but you should then make that opportunity available to all candidates in the race. So reaching out to their campaigns uh, to let them know, you know, another candidate is going to visit. Um, 
if, as long as you make it available, the option available to all candidates, um, it doesn't mean that all candidates have to show up. Um, and you can just remind people that you are a nonpartisan organization. You're not endorsing a candidate, um, but you know you're taking this opportunity to um, let that candidate uh, understand a little bit more about your organization and who you serve. So there are some things you do not want to be doing. So you want to avoid emphasizing individual candidates during primary season. So let's say a presidential candidate has put out a statement on your issue. You can mention that your issue is being discussed. You know, a great example with last night would be, you know, voting rights were finally brought up in a meaningful way during the debates. And then I could talk about nonprofit votes, you know, stance on, you know, voting rights or voting policies. Um, and I don't need to mention which, which campaign or which candidate um, you know, brought it up or, or what they said. Um, I like to think of this as the one time where it's really good to be like all about me. You know, most of us have that friend or that family member we don't like talking to because they always make whatever you're talking to about them, no matter how tenuously related these things are. Um, you know, what you, whatever your story was and whatever they want to talk about, well, here is a, an actually a good time to do that and to just turn it back into what your organization is doing, your stance on the cause or the issue that you're focused on. Um, and we can really leave the individual candidates or campaigns out of it. You also want to make sure campaigns aren't using your organization in their campaign materials uh, in any way that insinuates that you are um, supportive of their candidacy. So, you know, if you see that they've got a, you know, a major picture um, on their website that has, you know, a, a picture of, you know, your organization with your logo on it, um, you know, you might want to ask them to take that down if, if it looks like you're supporting their candidacy at all. And um, if you're going to candidate forums or posing candidates, uh, posing any sort of question to candidates, you want to make sure that those questions are unbiased and clear. So when I say unbiased, you're not projecting a correct answer. Um, you also want to make an attempt to ask all the questions, all the candidates that question. Um, I just saw American for the Arts made this really cool business card that had questions on it that people can, you know, sort of pull out and look at when they are talking. Um, at a candidate forum or two candidates. And so, you know, they don't have to remember it or be so put on the spot. They can just pull out their handy little card. Um, so asking candidates questions is a great thing to do. Uh, just make sure you're not projecting a bias at all. So um, once we've moved past primary elections, well, since primary elections really are spread out over the whole course of the whole year, it's good to think about them when we're preparing for 2020 elections in general. Obviously, November 3rd is kind of the big one here, the, the Super Bowl, so to speak. Um, and so I'm really happy to have Louisa Hackett, the Director of Community Votes, uh, sharing some ideas and tips for planning for these upcoming elections. So I am going to turn it over now. Thank you. So my name is Louisa Hackett and I established Community Votes to help large direct service nonprofits take up voter engagement work in a nonpartisan way. And I wanted to share today some few suggestions for how our organizations have done this work in the past. Next slide. Thank you. I wanted to cover uh, four things. First is to have organizations recognize all the assets they bring to this work. The second is to make sure you get the support of your organization's leaders, people who have the authority to okay what you're doing, so, and also so they can help promote and support the work. I also want to Reiterate what Caitlin has already talked about, the importance of knowing your state's deadlines and procedures to register people to vote. And finally, talk a little bit about 
some information that may be relevant to help people get excited about uh, voting and then beginning to develop a plan. Next slide. So in terms of assets, what do I mean? I'm not talking about money in the bank, although that's very important, but rather the connections your groups have with people. We often will start our trainings with organizations by asking everyone in the room to estimate the number of people of voting age they interact with each year. And this turns out to be a very powerful group ex exercise because it very quickly, people recognize the reach their organization has. So asset number one is really the number of new and potential voters your organization, organization can reach each year. Next, an asset to think about is the actual different ways your programs interact with people of voting age. I often like to begin with what I call sort of passive or light touch ways via your website, social media, or bulletin boards. Then thinking outward from there, all the different activities that involve staff first, such as program onboarding of new staff, staff meetings, holiday parties. Then to thinking about your program participants. Do you have a waiting room? Are there program orientations? What are the different ways your staff interacts with program participants? Finally, thinking about ways your organization may interact with the community. Do you host forums, educational events, health fairs, or summer events? All of these interactions provide an opportunity to insert conversations about voting. And the reason these interactions are so important is that voter research says it's really the old fashioned one on one conversations with people, particularly with someone who is trusted, that is the most effective way to get someone to vote. One word of caution, though, I want to uh, say is many groups immediately or often think about all the program intake conversations they have uh, uh, when they're uh, recruiting someone to get involved in a program. They may sit down and have an interview with them and gather a lot of information. And often people think, oh, we'll just add a question about voting. Uh, it turns out through research actually done by nonprofit vote, this does work, but it's not as effective as other, other interventions or interactions that involve groups of people. So think waiting rooms and group meetings. So one way to think about after you list all the different interactions you have with, an, with people is thinking about how you could reframe or adjust what you're already doing to incorporate conversations about voting. I just want to share one quick example. One of our partners annually has an art contest, and the winners are uh, displayed at a spring fair in their community center. So in a past election year, the group working on this decided to have the context, uh, contest focus on voting. So seniors in their senior program, students in their after school program, and high school students in their leadership development programs all participated and submitted art work that promoted voting and the winning art then was displayed on all their posters, flyers, and materials that were used that year to remind people to vote. A third asset is to identify what I call the political nerds within your organization who can then help you develop a plan. So strange as this may seem to those of us on this webinar, not everyone thinks about election politics and voting all the time. Most people actually only pay attention to it much closer to elections. But I found in every organization I part partnered with, there have been people who really care about voting or are excited about voting, and they want to figure out a way to uh, uh, give this sense of urgency to other people. So this was also true with one of the groups we worked with when we were sitting around a table trying to think about who could we help um, promote our this work within the community to register people to vote and get them out to vote. And some people from their senior center joined, including a woman named Maud, who was from the South. And she shared that when she was young, her parents were actually too scared to vote. And when she moved to New York City 60 years ago, she has voted in every single election. And that's actually saying a lot in New York because there are elections every year. 
And until this past year, we used to have two different primary election days, one in June and one in September. So we are very happy now that there's only one day. It makes it much easier. But Maud was our uh, one of the resident political nerds that helped this organization get out the vote. So uh, another asset to identify is all potential partners that you could work with. Um, some potential partners are local libraries, uh, good government groups such as Common Cause or the League of Women Voters. Your local Board of Elections may also be very helpful. Ours here in New York City, for example, provides training on voter registration. They also provide free posters and obviously the voter registration forms. Another type of partner to think about are those with expertise on an issue that your community cares about. They can be asked to join an educational event that concludes with offering people the opportunity to register to vote. I want to share sort of an example of how one of our partners included uh, uh, additional partners to do a National Voter Registration Day event. They invited the local branch library to a planning meeting and together they decided to create some games that combine civic education with registering to vote. So the community group designed sort of a gambling game. They used a big spinning wheel and when the wheel stopped on a number, rather than winning money, uh, they won the opportunity to test their civics know-how by being asked, for example, to name their st state legislator or guess what percentage of people voted in the last election in their neighborhood. So the spinning wheel was really a way to attract people to the voter registration table. So a conversation about voting could happen. Next slide. So it's very important also to get leadership on board. This will make it a critical step to be successful because when an executive director or a senior manager says this work is important, it will make it much easier to recruit people to help. They also will have ideas about how the work promotes the organization's mission, and they can probably also help you identify those political nerds on staff who won't see it as a burden to think about how to insert voting within existing programs and activities. They may also know which programs might be the best fit for this type of work. If any of your organizations have a communication staff person, a leader can also direct them to help with messaging about why your organization cares about voting and how, and how it connects to the mission. Leaders also know the ins and outs of the organization's budget, and they might be able to identify some extra funds to pay for materials like flyers or posters. In short, getting leadership support will make it easier to create a plan. Next slide. So the last things I wanted to share with you today are to learn the rules, gather information, and then develop a plan. In terms of learning the rules, the partners we mentioned earlier, such as the local Board of Elections, League of Women Voters, or a good government group like Common Cause, may be able to conduct a training on how to do nonpartisan voter registration. They may be able to also provide educational materials. When thinking about when to do this work, as Caitlin mentioned in terms of, it's important to know the primary dates and also the deadlines for when people are able to register to vote in order to vote in that year's primary. Not every state, unfortunately, or not every state yet, allows people to register to vote on the day of the election. It can also, it's also helpful to know if there are any identification requirements when registering to vote or voting so you can share that with a prospective voter. Finally, it's also good to know whether your state has what's called an open or a closed primary. An open primary means someone does not have to be registered in, for example, the Republican Party to vote in that Republican Party's primary. Here in New York City and state, we have what are called closed primaries. So when someone is registered to vote, we are able to explain that if they decide to register as an independent or do not choose a party, they can only vote in the general election and not in the primary elections. So that's an important piece of information to know when you're out there encouraging people to register to vote. Other information that can be helpful 
is knowing the voter turnout rates for your area. Nonprofit vote has reports on this by state and your local election bureau should have data you can use to calculate it for your local area. This is important, I believe, because many people don't realize how low voter turnout rates are. I was doing a training at a community-based organization and one of the young men, we were, I was sharing how low the turnout rates are for uh, non-presidential elections and for local elections. Then the young man at the, in the room said, oh, I guess everybody thinks everybody else is voting, but it turns out no one's voting. So it can sort of be a little bit of a call to action. Finally, it can also be helpful to explain what offices are on the ballot beyond the president. There will also be races for U.S. Senate and representatives and perhaps also for state positions. A very good source for this information is a website called Ballotpedia. It's like Wikipedia, but for ballots. And I'm sorry, I didn't put it on this slide, but it's Ballotpedia. So once you know your organization's assets, the potential number of people you can reach, and you've thought about all the different ways to reach people and the different partners who may be able to help you join at that effort, and you've also gotten your leadership's blessing, and you know how to answer basic questions about getting registered to vote and have some basic information about the elections, you really are now able to develop a plan. Nonprofit Vote has a very useful template on their website under resources. And some questions you might wanna think about in your plan is, what are your goals? So a word of caution, sometimes when groups count up all the people they interact with, they can create some very ambitious and unrealistic goals of registering hundreds and thousands of people. Uh, and this can be hard to do so, it doesn't necessarily have to be a goal about numbers of people you register. You could also have a goal be that you actually formed a committee of committed staff to develop the plan. And that actually can set the stage for work to be continued in other elections. Another question to think about is, do we need to be trained on the voter registration procedures? Um, do we need to be trained on how to make sure we're nonpartisan? Uh, another question is, who should we target? If, we're, if you're a large organization, you might want to start with the people you're closest to, so your staff. Another question is, do you want to do get out the vote work, do some reminders to vote, or just focus on voter registration? So working backwards from the voter registration deadlines, you can think about your existing scheduled events or regular ongoing activities that you can use to take advantage of getting out to vote. So that was a very quick, <laughs> summary of what you could do now to get ready uh, and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Again, a lot packed into a little bit of time. So um, we designed this session to make it as um, digestible as possible, you know, a one hour using as little bit of your time to get the max amount of information. Um, so now is your opportunity to ask some questions to our speakers. So we have a few and uh, we will, I'll get started with some of these. So um, the first one I want to ask, um, Bob, Bob has a great question that I will pose to you, Bessie. Um, I think it's about census. He asks, how soon... Uh, how soon should they begin canvassing? Is January or February too early for canvassing? Bob, that's a great question. And I think it really depends on the community that you're working in. I think you know your community best. I think the only like hard stop that we have is that canvassing shouldn't continue into May since that's when the run response follow-up starts but I think it's up to you how early you would like to start canvassing and of course you might be focusing on different messages if you begin earlier just letting people know that they'll be receiving information in March um, about what if what your organization might be doing um, to help them with responding to the census but it's really up to you. Thank you. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, we have a, I really like this question. Someone is asking about, uh, Risa asks if we can combine nonpartisan asks and census education when we knock on doors in the community, or is there a firewall issue when we combine the two asks? Um, so for either of our speakers, do you know of anything that would prevent people from um, talking about both voter voter registration or voter engagement and the census? Hi, this is Louisa. I'm uh, also working on census uh, work in New York City. And uh, the city decided to do a firewall because there's such um, fear within the immigrant community related to the uh, uh, thought that there might be a census question, a citizenship question. So uh, it was decided actually to make a firewall because we didn't want anybody to uh, fear that they needed to be a citizen to participate in this census. That, that's a great consideration, you know, thinking through um, whether these messages would conflict in just in terms of um, providing, you know, creating a sense of stress or confusion around who should be participating in what and how. Um, Bessie, have you heard anything about um, groups either deciding to keep these separate or any ideas around how they have could or could successfully um, combine these two? Um, I'm not sure of what a lot of local organizations are doing around sending these firewalls, but I do think the audience is a little bit different because the census, we do want to keep um, lifting up that everyone is meant to be counted in the census, so that message might be a little bit different. Uh, yeah, and I'll just add that um, I know some groups are using some of the census activities. It's, it's sort of like practice for voter engagement. So a lot of the same things that you're thinking through are how are we communicating this? Um, are, we, are we doing events? Um, are we talking about this uh, in our waiting room, et cetera? So I think if you, you know, start with talking about census, you know, once you get into July and uh, census is essentially wrapping up at that time, um, you can use a lot of the same tactics with just a slightly, um, you know, somewhat narrowed down audience um, for the voter messaging. Um, so we've seen groups using pledge to count cards um, and then they're going to transition to pledge to vote cards. Um, so, so you can use a lot of the same tactics, even if you're not talking about them um, at the same time or during the same interaction with a client or community member. Um, we have a question about um, encouraging, I think it's really on the theme, about encouraging mar marginalized populations to participate, uh, if, even if you can't guarantee their safety. Uh, this person doesn't trust, and neither do their clients trust that their data will not be used against them. Um, given the uh, history of using census data during World War II uh, to uh, round up or segregate Japanese citizens. Um, Bessie, what are some messages that uh, you've heard or you're using to put people at ease and get them to participate? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for bringing that up. So we are in a climate of fear and people's reactions and fears um, that they may have are valid and I think it's so important for us to address that. Um, specifically around Japanese American incarceration, so the most notable cases of disclosure of unpublished information um, from the Census Bureau to another federal agency was during World War II um, when they had shared some information with the Department of War. Uh, and so their actions did not fully come to light until the early 2000s. And as deplorable as the agency's actions were, it's important to know that this was not done in violation of the law as written at the time. Uh, so during that time, the Census Act had authorized the Census Director to release that information if he deemed necessary. And the War Powers Act, which is now long expired, had explicitly superseded the Title 13 confidentiality protections. So those were the protections I had been talking about earlier. Um, so what happened during World War II that led to the incarceration of Japanese Americans was, in fact, the reason for strengthening those confidentiality 
confidentiality protections, um, which now prohibit any disclosure of personally identifiable information for any purpose whatsoever. And when we're addressing um, these fears, I think it's important to note that at the end of the day, it's a personal choice whether or not someone responds to the census. That said, it is required by law and the stakes are so high for our communities. Um, so I had mentioned $1.5 trillion for hospital schools and roads annually. Our political representation and also language access um, this is also really important for our communities to have visibility. I think the data that's collected during the census is really important for us um, in order to understand where our communities are and what challenges they might face. Um, but there absolutely is a lot of fear and mistrust, and I think it's really important to, um, to discuss that and address that. Um, but hopefully we can also help people understand why it's important to participate in the first place. Thank you. Um, our next question, um, I think this was a good one for you, Louisa. Uh, when should organizations ideally kick off their 2020 voter engagement work? Oh, I was just typing an answer. Uh, and the answer is to consider when the last dates to register to vote are for either the primary or general election. You might want to uh, back into that and kick off your events around those deadlines. Similarly, you might want to focus it on the primary election dates or a couple of weeks before your, uh, the general election. Many organizations have found it easier to sort of focus on one date. So some groups do National Voter Registration Day, which I believe, Caitlin, correct me if I'm wrong, is it the fourth Tuesday of September? Yes, it's the yes. fourth Tuesday of September, and so it'll be September 22nd. So s some organizations find that uh, uh, a convenient time to sort of um, uh, do, do a big event. All right. Yeah, I, I'd say um, the always the first order of business is the research on, on the dates, like you said, and, you know, sort of work backwards from there. Um, okay, another, uh, another census related question, Bessie, um, given the current fear around um, interacting with ICE for immigrant communities, um, is there any messaging or materials for identifying census takers or those enumerators? Yeah, um, so the Census Bureau has released information including videos on how to identify a census taker. So for example, they'll always have a Census Bureau badge. Um, they may carry a Census Bureau laptop bag um, and they'll have like a letter that talks about what they're doing. And so there's um, both materials and videos from the Census Bureau and also a lot of community-based organizations are creating their own materials. Um, so for Countess in 2020, we have a fact sheet that's coming out um, in the next week or so on identifying a census taker and that will also be translated into 15 Asian languages. Great. Um, and can folks still resp self-respond during that period, May through July, when those enumerators will be out? Yes, folks can still self-respond during the non-response follow-up period. Awesome. Okay, so there's a uh, I think just one more uh, big question. If anyone has questions, um, they're welcome to email them to uh, me uh, if you respond to the um, emails that were sent as a reminder for this webinar. Those should end up with me. Um, Linda is wondering, when is the best month to hold a public meeting on the census? Um, so I think that would be you, Bessie. To hold a public meeting on the census? Yeah, I think you mentioned one of the ways that people could get engaged or build awareness is by holding a, a meeting. Yeah, um, I think in terms of timing, um, it's really helpful January through 
July. I think on the earlier end, you'll let people know what the census is, um, how they might be invited to respond, um, what your organizations might be doing to provide support. And then in March, you'll be letting people know that they'll be getting the information in the mail to respond. Um, and then also when non-response follow-up happens um, from May to July, um, ensuring that people know how to identify a census taker and that if they didn't respond, the census takers will be coming um, to their household to collect that information. Um, if I had to pick a date, I'd say April 1st, um, because it's census day, it's a good reference date for people. So it's good for a day of action if you want a public meeting to encourage people to self respond. But really um, having meetings and having different events uh, anytime leading up to the census um, is helpful. Great, thank you.